Welcome to Dorsey and Whitney's webinar on After Lockdown. What's next for UK landlords and tenants? I'd like to introduce Melissa Moyle, a partner in Dorsey's London Real Estate Group. Melissa? Thank you, Sean. Um, just a quick housekeeping note before we start the presentation. Um, there are no US CLE credits for this webinar. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm here with my colleague, Senior Associate Joseph Lewin, who's in our litigation group in the London office. Um, and we're going to be talking about the impact that COVID-19 has had on the real estate market in the UK. So from the beginning of this year, um, we had COVID-19 looming in the background. We all watched the news from Asia, Italy before it reached other parts of Europe and coming to the UK. Um, the government was very hesitant um, in announcing a formal lockdown. Many businesses had either closed or had instructed staff to work from home. I know my last day in the office was 17th of March. Not very satisfactory for the retail and leisure industry with people advised not to attend with no formal instructions to shut. The formal announcement was finally made by the Prime Minister on the 23rd of March that the UK was moving into a formal lockdown. Excluded from that was essential retail of food and hardware shops and the key um, healthcare workers and other um, necessary industries such as construction, which is a bit of a gray area. Um, there were varying types of lockdown. UK is generally seen as looser than other European countries like Italy, France and Spain, but obviously still felt quite restrictive for the UK. So this webinar looks at the government measures which were introduced, um, what has been and will likely continue to happen on the ground, and the balancing act of the measures brought in by the government between protecting landlords and tenant interests. Um, as you will be aware, the landlord lobby in the UK is extremely strong, but the government was keen to protect businesses. And with the June rent quarter day approaching, it'll be interesting to see what happens going forward. So I will hand you over to Joseph, who will talk through the measures introduced by the government. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I'm Joseph Lewin. I'm a senior associate at Dorsey & Whitney in its London trial team. I'm going to speak about the measures the government's instituted to deal with the crisis that impact on landlords and tenants in the commercial sector in England and Wales. Uh, similar legislation has been passed in relation to Scotland and Northern Ireland and in relation to the residential sector, but I'm not going to cover any of those here. Uh, so it's fair to say that COVID has made an unprecedented impact on all of our lives. And given the nature of the crisis, uh, it of course impacts uh, property in the real estate sector particularly. Um, First and most importantly, as we're all now very familiar, and as Melissa's just mentioned, the government's put in place uh, lockdown restrictions across the United Kingdom. Uh, and the key piece of legislation uh, by which it achieved that was the uh, Health Protection Regulation 2020. Uh, those have now been amended multiple times, including last time, uh, just a week before last on Friday. Uh, these regulations originally made it an offence for a person to be outside of their home without reasonable excuse and they also closed most non-essential businesses and these have gradually been eased uh, and increasingly shops are being permitted to open but the lockdown has still had a very direct impact on uh, the real estate sector and in particular it's prevented the physical occupation and use of many premises which has meant widespread closure of business premises and very serious cash flow difficulties, which have left many tenants uh, struggling to fulfill um, payment obligations, such as rent, which nonetheless have remained fixed. Uh, and it's put them therefore at risk of breaching lease covenants for risk, uh, rent payment, among other things. From an early stage, there's been awareness that the government would need to step in and legislate to protect uh, tenants and landlords who are suffering from the commercial effect of the virus. Uh, the key legislation there is the Coronavirus Act 2020, which came into force on the 26th of March, uh, which introduced measures to protect tenants from the effect of the lockdown. Um, now, the majority of provisions of the Act are going to be enforced for six months only, so it's a temporary, uh, temporary legislation, but there's the possibility of further extensions uh, for two further periods of six months. Now, its primary purpose is to assist tenants. Uh, typically for a business tenancy, if rent's not paid, then a landlord can re-enter the property and take possession. That's known as forfeiture. Doing so effectively terminates the lease and enables a landlord to gain possession and put the property back on the market. Uh, 
Now, the Act substantially limits the ability of landlords to do that. Uh, the main provision in the Act is Section 82, which is up on the slide, um, and then that's done in tandem with another measure, which is amendments to the civil procedure rules, which are the rules that govern litigation in England and Wales. So initially, that was by introducing a new perhaps direction 51Z, um, which is brought into effect on the 27th of March, and that put in place sweeping amendments to the old practice direction 55. Um, now, all of these changes were originally due to be effective only up until the end of June 2020. That time limit is now running out. So on the 10th of June, another amendment has been made, which brings into place a new further amendment to the CPRs, to the civil procedure rules, that come into force this week on the 25th of June. And those are more or less identical to what we've had up to now, except that they are effective until uh, the 23rd of August. So that's another eight weeks of, uh, of uh, this, this moratorium. And the effect of the two acting together is to uh, place an effective pause on any proceedings for forfeiture. So um, section 82 suspends a landlord's right to forfeit or payment of rent for a relevant period that was originally 26th of March till the 30th of June. And on top of that, you have a further period that goes up to the 23rd of August, during which no measures can be progressed, although they can uh, potentially still be brought. So during this period, uh, the right of re-entry or forfeiture for non-payment of rent uh, can't be enforced up until the 30th of June and where a uh, landlord has already started enforcing, those proceedings are stayed, i.e. they are paused. Now, after the 30th of June, you can again uh, potentially issue possession orders or seek possession, but those orders cannot be progressed. They're also stayed until the 23rd of August. And any order that the court makes can't require a tenant to give up possession until after 30th of June. So the message is very clear, no forfeiture or orders for possession during the relevant period. Uh, these have already been through the court and the court has already shown that it's willing to enforce the act. Um, these measures are primarily there to protect tenants but they're not only there for tenants and there are some provisions that protect landlords too. So for example uh, the act makes clear that no conduct by or on behalf of a landlord is to be regarded as waiving a right of forfeiture for non-payment of rent unless the landlord has said so expressly in writing. Uh, that's important because Anyone who has uh, worked on the landlord side of a, a forfeiture discussion knows that the biggest danger when approaching a tenant is that you might waive your right to retake possession through forfeiture. Since the introduction of the Act, there have been a few new exceptions that have been brought in. Uh, most of those are fairly easily understandable and probably would have been included in the Act uh, when it was first drafted had, had it not been done on such an urgent basis. So for example, uh, you can begin possession proceedings to evict trespassers or to enter property where there's real need to do so, such as where there's a gas leak and it's not being fixed. But in summary, there's, there's currently otherwise no right of re-entry. Now, it's important to note that this doesn't mean that landlords are completely hamstrung uh, and there are still numerous opportunities available for landlords looking to enforce rent provisions. So, First and foremost, rent deposits remain available as before. Uh, there's nothing to stop a landlord from uh, suing a tenant for debt or for damages if they haven't paid. And there's nothing to stop a landlord from suing guarantors. Nor does it prevent a landlord from uh, enforcing rights for things other than non-payment of rent. So for example, repairs. Um, originally, the act didn't stop statutory demands for winding up, i.e. putting tenants into insolvency, nor did it stop um, a distress claim, so commercial rent arrears claim, but those are now off the table. Um, and we're going to explain why very shortly. But for the time being, the Coronavirus Act protects tenants from forfeiture, but any amounts due under the lease continue to accrue and remain the tenant's liability. Now, since the Act, there have been further measures put in place to protect debtors. One of these uh, is the taking control of goods regulations, which came in on the 25th of April, and that imposed restrictions on enforcement action by landlords, uh, including an increase in the minimum unpaid rent that must be outstanding before a landlord can begin a commercial rent arrears claim. A commercial rent arrears claim uh, is what used to be called distress, 
and that's a right to seize goods that are kept on a property to satisfy an existing debt. It used to be possible to do that after seven days. Currently, that's been stretched to 90 days unpaid rent. So that's a significant uh, increase in the standard um, before a commercial rent arrears claim can be commenced. The other important measure, um, and really quite a significant piece of legislation, is the Corporate Insolvency and Governance, Governance Bill, which was first published on the 20th of May. Uh, now that proposes sweeping reforms of uh, UK insolvency and governance law uh, that covers really all areas of business. Um, one thing that it does do is aims to prevent aggressive rent collection uh, by restricting the use of winding up orders. And winding up proceedings are where a creditor puts a corporate debtor into insolvency for non-payment of debt, having first served a statutory demand on the debtor. Uh, the bill is still in its early stages, but if it's passed in its current form, it's going to have a very significant effect. And it proposes that no petition for winding up a company can be presented for a specified time period. And that specified time period is starting from the 27th of April, um, based on any statutory demand, which is the precursor to a winding up order, that is served between the 1st of March and the later of 30th of June and one month after the measures come into force. So it's going to be that second because uh, we, we're getting close to the end of 30th of June already. And any existing winding up orders are void. And even where this blanket restriction doesn't apply, so where you don't fall in that time period, um, creditors still can't present winding up petitions on the ground of an inability to pay debts unless the creditor has reasonable grounds for believing that the coronavirus has not had a financial effect on the company or that the debt issues would have arisen anyway. So in the current circumstances, that's going to be very difficult to show uh, given the economic impact of the coronavirus. So the bill passed Commons very quickly uh, and looked like it was going to be published in late June, but it's become stuck in the House of Lords, largely on constitutional concerns. But in the meantime, the courts are already showing a willingness to enforce it uh, prospectively, even though it hasn't yet become UK law. So in summary, before I hand you over to Melissa, uh, the government's already put in place some very significant changes aimed to protect tenants suffering from the economic effect of the current crisis. And there are more of these on the way. For the time being, there's an effective moratorium on forfeiture to obtain possession. Uh, the government's increased the limit required before commercial rent arrears claims can be started. Uh, and there's going to be sweeping restrictions on the circumstances in which insolvency proceedings can be commenced. However, other routes to enforcement still remain open, including claims to recover debts, drawing down the rent deposit, and enforcement of other aspects of the lease, like repair provisions. Um, and of course, it, it shouldn't be forgotten that uh, the rent obligations continue to mount up. They don't seem to go away. So I'm now going to hand you over to Melissa, who will talk you through the current issues that we are seeing commercially in the landlord and tenant sector. Thanks, Joseph. And just to say, if you have any questions, you can submit them through the chat function, and we'll try and answer those at the end. Alternatively, you can take it offline and contact Joseph or myself afterwards. So if we move to the next slide, Joseph. Um, the issues that we see at the minute are fairly obviously non-payment of rent um, and other charges due under the lease. As Joseph has explained, the government measures have prevented actions being taken in relation to forfeiture, re-entry, and given the various parties breathing space um, in which to deal with any financial difficulties they may be facing. Um, we've also had breaches of the obvious ones like keep open covenants. Now these are generally just in retail leases. Um, it is generally a difficult breach to pursue in any event, um, but in this one even more difficult for a landlord to pursue it as the statutory compliance clause will trump this as it was a, an official government order to shut down the premises. Other breaches probably occur in relation to repair, alterations, dilapidations that need to be served at the end of the lease, specifically if there are any time stipulations, both tenants and landlords need to be aware of this because many buildings could not be visited and inspections, uh, inspections carried out during the lockdown period. Um, and we know that there's a backlog of um, issues to be dealt with. So any time stipulations in the lease do need to be 
um, borne in mind. So what options are there then for the landlord and the tenant? Well, really, it's to make any payments due if possible. Um, interest is also due if this is provided for in the lease. In most modern leases, interest will be reserved as a separate rent. So if you pay the rent and don't pay the interest, it may give the landlord another ground to forfeit the lease. Um, and it may also impact on exercising a break option in any lease further down the line, where a condition of the break is the payment of all rents up to the break. Um, and from the landlord's perspective, you've got to ask yourself, is forfeiture always the best option? Um, you've got the prospect of being left with an empty property, um, not very attractive for any prospective new tenants. For example, if you are located on the high street or in a shopping centre retail park, where any incoming tenants will be looking at the footfall and the look of the premises, whether it fits with their business needs and requirements. The tenants that are there may already be paying some costs, so they may not be paying the large annual rent, but they would be covering service charge, insurance rent, utilities, rates. Normally, I know there's a rates holiday this year, um, but just to think of the impact going forward. And then obviously, what is the likelihood of getting a new tenant? And what will the current rental per square foot be? Has the, have the rents held up? Or are they going to decline for the foreseeable future? And it's very difficult to know what the market is going to be like going forward. There was a shortage of office space in the part of London known as the city and the fringes moving into Shoreditch and Spitalfield. Um, but will that hold up in the future? Retail was already in difficulties, but impacted now even further. Um, there's a question of demand for office space is going to decline. Working for home has certainly worked well for many sectors. Other sectors probably not quite so well. And then you have areas like warehouses, storage facilities, which are probably more attractive now that more people move to online shopping and see the benefits of that. Our experience has been that a lot of landlords and tenants are now working together more. This will very much depend on the respective landlords and tenants. Some landlords will have deeper pockets than others. Some tenants or some landlords um, may have quite large financial loans, which they'll have to bear in mind. Um, but a lot of the work that we've been carrying out um, deals with rent concessions. So side letters for monthly rent payments instead of quarterly, where we're trying to help tenants out with their cash flows. Maybe both parties sharing the pain, a rent holiday for a stipulated time period, just to reflect the current situation. And they are generally for quite short durations. We've also had to look at variations of leases and contracts. This has involved varying the terms of leases. So maybe you would stipulate a rent-free period in return for a future higher rent or a different earlier rent review and um, so that you're taking the loss now but building it into your figures for the future. Um, if you have any contracts in place at the minute, they could be sale contracts or agreements for lease. These are generally contractually binding and you need to look at each and every respective contract. Check if there are any termination rights in the contract or agreement that give either the landlord or the tenant a get out. Um, get out clauses are generally very unlikely, especially in an agreement for lease. You generally don't find provisions like force majeure clauses. That may be something that will change in the future, but certainly as of now, very, very rare. Um, there is another doctrine in the UK which you can rely on, frustration. We had a separate webinar on that a few weeks ago. You can probably find it on our website. Very high bar to prove frustration, very um, unlikely to succeed. We've actually had recent case law here in the UK um, related to a lease where they tried to argue frustration, but it was thrown out of court. The risk for both parties, of course, is that you will be sued for breach of contract and the same party will need to prove loss. And again, it will be it depend on each and every contract that's been entered into and the wordings in there. Again, we have negotiated variations to both contracts and agreement for lease. And this is generally fruitful where it's the benefit of both parties. And we generally find that both parties have been trying to work together, trying to get something to work to their mutual advantage. Um, Another area where we've seen a lot of activity is obviously in relation to construction and fit out works. Constru construction has actually been quite a grey area during the lockdown in the UK. 
Um, a lot of construction sites have stayed open as permitted by the government um, where it was necessary and essential. Now, there is some debate as to whether some of the structures going up or the work continuing were essential, um, but we've definitely seen a lot of activity continuing in the city. Um, some did stop, some had to be negotiated. Um, the works may have been carried out by the landlord or the tenant or both or buyer or seller, depending on the agreement. Um, construction contracts are slightly different from property documents in that they tend to have force majeure clauses um, and also provisions for extensions of time. And we have seen that with a lot of clients at the minute where those um, provisions are being relied on. Um, and it's also impacting on tenants coming into buildings. So it's just something to be aware of. These can be renegotiated by side letters, side agreements, very easy as long as both parties have the same aim in mind. Other documents to be aware of, um, if you've been carrying out works to your property, licenses to alter for carrying out works usually have time stipulations for the carrying out of those works. Um, and these can usually be extended by agreement between the parties or a supplementary license. It's just something to be aware of. The normal time stipulation is usually two or three months, um, but very easily extendable and certainly in the circumstances should not be an issue. There may be long stop dates in contracts or agreements releases. These usually give either party the right to terminate the contract by a certain date if um, the property or conditions in the contract aren't fulfilled. Again, it depends on the provisions in each and every agreement, um, but generally the market acceptance is that it's 20 working days. And um, so even though you give the notice, the other party has 20 working days to rectify the defect before the con contract falls away. Something that's not quite strictly property, but still is relevant is insurance. Um, always worth checking. I know a lot of businesses have business interruption policies in place. Most businesses don't seem to have been covered by this. Again, it will depend on the policy and the wording. Some actually thought they were covered by um, infectious diseases and causes, and it looks like they're not. I mean, I'm referring here to Raymond Blanc, whose case was in the papers a few months ago. Um, so we'll just keep an eye on that. Then we have the impact on current negotiations, and this is where no contract has been signed. The parties are in the middle of agreeing the terms. And we see now that a lot of businesses are now looking at their needs and if they've changed and what do they actually need going forward. Um, parties may need to try and change the agreed terms. I've certainly seen a lot of deals put on hold. Some parties have unfortunately pulled out of deals. Um, and in that situation where people have invested a lot of time and a lot of costs through surveys or legal fees and surveyors fees, it can be very hard. Uh, heads of terms especially are generally not legally binding. But of course, as with all documentation, it will depend on the drafting and the construction of the document. So if you had lawyers involved at the start, both parties are generally trying to avoid the heads of terms being legally binding. But if it was in and agreed between two parties very casually, there's always room for error. So it's definitely worth going back to check all of the details. And as we are aware, it's going to be a hard time for a lot of people, but for potential buyers and investors, this in brings a lot of opportunities. So there are certainly deals out in the markets and the surveyors always seem to be the ones in the know, but there's certainly a lot more cash floating around than there was in 2009 at the last recession. Joseph, you move on to the next slide. So just looking at the practical considerations going forward, um, for a lot of tenants and landlords, the, all of these points apply. Um, if you're looking at service charges, um, who pays for the new measures in common areas, the more regular and in-depth cleaning, better maintenance, more regular checks on air conditioning, airflow in the premises, and preparation for social distancing. I mean, ideally, this should all be documented in the documentation and the leases, the licenses, whatever you are occupying under, but it doesn't always happen. And um, there generally are sweeper clauses in the service charge provisions that cover um, all eventualities, but just if not, you should always check your documents and make sure 
that you're either recouping your money if you're the landlord or you're not paying too much of the tenant because we know that not all tenants are going to return to the buildings in the occupancy they were before. So there will be a slight grievance that they're paying for a service that they have not and will not be receiving for a while. Um, you may need to start resuming fit out works. Again, you're going to have to make sure, as I mentioned before, that the licenses are still in effect and valid. Do you need to do anything differently? Um, will your team on site be able to comply with government regulations in relation to social distancing um, and making sure everybody is safe? Um, maybe you're looking going forward at what your business needs are going to be. So you should always look at the term of any documents, the leases going forward. Are there any break dates? Do you think that you want to vacate the property or do you want to instigate discussions with either the landlord or the tenant, depending on which way the break operates to get a better deal? Maybe move to a bigger or a smaller space. Do you want to move to a different building? Um, do you have a rent review coming up? Maybe you just see yourself being able to leverage it slightly more to your advantage. And the one thing to bear in mind, of course, is that once a break notice is served, it cannot be withdrawn. So if you do decide to do a deal after you've served your break notice, you need to make sure those documents are signed and agreed before the break date, because you don't want to invalidate the break and find out you still have to stay in that property for the remainder of the original lease. Maybe your business needs have changed even further in that you're thinking about assigning the lease, underletting, or maybe surrendering. Now, some landlords are not going to be in a position to do deals, but some of the larger institutional landlords will have a lot deeper pockets. They may decide to use this time to refurb older buildings. Um, property is very cyclical, and they may already have something in mind. So there's always the opportunity to do some new deal, put some new... Um, something in front of the landlord they may not have thought before. Um, the same with the assignment and underletting, you'll have to comply with the provisions of the different documents, but it may be something to consider if you have somebody trying to move into your space in your area. In relation to practical considerations, both again, very similar for landlords and tenants. Um, you need to ensure if you're the tenant that the landlord is complying with the regulations. If you're the landlord, you need to make sure the tenant is complying with the regulations. Everybody's going to have similar issues with common areas, um, social distancing, sanitizers, screen perspect protectors, management of traffic, limiting touch points, lift area management, limiting the number of people in the lifts more regular cleaning, re-engaging building systems to make sure they're compliant, that the water and air has been flushed around the building um, and it's fit for use. Um, and I know a lot of buildings have continued to operate during the lockdown, but some have shut up completely. Make sure that your health and safety procedures are up to date and in place and are ready for inspection. That's for both landlords and tenants. And then obviously, as well as the building, it's the requirements for employees. So that's up to each individual business to decide whether you have thermometers, masks, sanitizers on each floor. Um, there's quite a lot to think about and the regulations are changing every day. And um, we see lots of discussions in the press. From a property law perspective, at the minute, it feels very different from the last recession. Definitely more collaboration government intervention to a degree which certainly in my experience I haven't seen so much of where there is an intention obviously to have the balancing protecting the landlord and the tenant who both sometimes have different ultimate goals but they don't particularly want business to go to the wall now it will be a very tough six to twelve months going ahead but hopefully it's managed to get a lot of businesses through the worst of this particular um, pandemic the next government update is tomorrow and um, we need to be aware that each part of the UK is different and the restrictions are being relaxed at different stages. So while we deal with properties in England and Wales, um, the Wales Assembly are implementing measures at a different speed than the English courts or sorry, the English government and the same with Scotland and Northern Ireland. So if you have businesses in different parts of the UK, you just need to be aware that they're all being implemented at different timings and different uh, different dates. Um, we expect tomorrow that in England, the social distancing may be reduced from two meters to one meters. Um, this will be in relation to the next phase of opening, which we are anticipating will be the 4th of July. But again, this is subject 
to the government and the Prime Minister's announcements tomorrow, which will hopefully see retail, sorry, restaurants, pubs, hairdressers and beauticians and such businesses reopen. So it's a case of watch the space. Um, and I think that was everything. Did anybody have any questions? Can't see anything in the chat, which I take it means no. If you do want to raise anything um, afterwards, do feel free to contact either Joseph or myself. As I said, this is a, a fluid situation and we expect many more bumps along the road as we get to whatever the new normal will be. Thank you very much for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>